biggest the brownie was hurrying through the woods on his little red bicycle when he suddenly bumped into somebody down went down they went and the bicycle fell on top of figures with a crash which he said and rubbed the bump on his head which said the person he had bumped into and sat up to look at Biggest. Biggest looked at him too. You're rather a. You're rather a. You're rather a peculiar looking person, said Biggest, staring. What are you? You're not a pixie or a brown or a goblin, are you? No, said the person. He had not over nodding his head are you a toy asked biggest i've never seen one quite like you i don't think so said the strange person nodding his head why do you nod your head when you say no asked biggest still staring because i'm a little little man said the Small fellow, my head spans on my neck in such a way that I have to nod when I speak. What's that? Is it somebody after me? Though no, it's only a field mouse scurrying by, said Biggies, getting up. Where do you live? And why aren't you afraid? Of somebody coming back to you because I ran away, said the Arctic man. <laughs> I belong to old man Cavern. Cavern. Away in the woods to the lake. He made me. He went with this new friend, said Biggins. Now, did he make you? <laughs> he made wooden feet and wooden and then wooden legs and then a round wooden body, then wooden arms and hands and then wooden neck and then. At round bottom face, and did he stick them to all together and make you ask big ears? You got funny eyes and funny hair too. What are they made of? The old man laid hold of my wooden head and then put blue beads into the holes said the naughty man that's why i've got such like blue eyes he made my hair out of bits of fur from a cat's back she said he could young why are you running a well asked if it's getting on his bicycle because it's so lonely with old man Carver said the little man besides he's carving up lion now and I don't like lions I want to go and live somewhere where there are lots and lots of people. Then I really think you ought to live in Toyland, said Biggie. You're not a brownie, so you can't live in my town. You're not exactly a toy either, but you're very nice one. You'd better 
go to toy land. I don't know the way, said the little naughty man, and his head got in stoutly. But I do, said Big Ears. Stand on the step of my bicycle. Look, put your foot there. That's right, and I'll take you to catch the toy land train. But Rodin Man did as he was told. He nearly fell off when Big Ears rode down the path. And he clutched at his pointed ears in front. What's your name? shouted Big Ears as they went along. Hey, they like, hey, you don't Five ears. Tell me your length. I haven't got one, said the naughty man. What do you suppose my name ought to be? Nanny, naughty, I should think, said the ears. Nanny, naughty, over fat. Over a black fat beetle. Look out where you run, people. Yes, I think you'll read this little naughty man. This naughty little naughty man. I think so, said naughty happily. Yes. And um, naughty, of course. Ooh, what's that? That's the train whistling, said Big Ears. Edmund, all at all at, at the winter's face. We shall just catch it, I come with you if you like. They rode into the station at top speed, just as the train was running from the middle All aboard for Toyland, cried out boys. All aboard for Toyland. Hello. This is David Laurie, your cousin. I am six years old and I have just read you this story. Did you like my story? I had a birthday party last week and I had six children to it. And I had lots and lots of live presents and some Lego. And the Lego was different to the Lego I had before. And it, and the new Lego is blue and yellow and some blue corners which can make a gasometer and some little white and red pinnacles. And I wish you a happy Christmas and goodbye. Hello, this is Anthony. It is my birthday today. It is April the 12th and I have had lots of lovely presents. I'm spending the day at Grandma's with some of my friends. I am having a lovely time. It is raining today, but we went up on the hills with, with my new pop gun rifle. It fires a cork on the string and it goes pop when you fire it. I... I hope you had a nice Christmas and and I have got an Austin Healy. It's it's an electric model for my birthday. It, it can nearly race me when I'm nearly running. And it did this morning. I got it this morning for my birthday. It is very nice. That's all. I had a game of rugby today in the garden when it had stopped raining with my new rugby ball that Andrew Quayle gave me. He is one of the two friends that came. 
John played with me, and I won. Yes. And David Morehouse was in my team, and Andrew Quayle was in John's team. Daddy and Mummy gave me a desk and chair. It is very big, and Daddy gave me a blotter. I've got a pen and an ink bottle, but the ink sometimes nearly falls over, so Mummy is going to buy me a bottle of ink that won't. Hello, Betty. A Merry Christmas to you and to all the family. I'm giving you this greeting somewhere around the autumnal equinox and distinct from the winter solstice. Nevertheless, it is all the same sincere. The reason for this rather early Woolworths type of greeting is that I should not be sure of coming home again and having the opportunity of of recording on this tape before the tape is sent to you. I go back to Birmingham on Thursday, that is to say in four days' time. The next two days will be step spent at Mary's, which leaves only one day to be certain of doing it. Alternatively, I suppose, I could speak to you over the telephone as I did last year. This, however, is, has this advantage of, of being expensive, limiting me to three minutes, and being rather indistinct. Only this afternoon I saw your holiday photographs taken in Delaware Bay. I'm sorry there are so few of them. We come to expect a packet of photographs whenever you send them to us. Still, they're very good. I notice that you're still the same fine bonny figure of a girl you were when I remember you back here. I suppose I shall have to go through the usual conceited sort of list of my doings for the year, as Mummy and Daddy will tell you most of the other things that happened. This last year has been a great deal of fun for me, Betty. My first year university, I suppose it was bound to be. I've made a lot of friends, or at least half a dozen friends, that I, I value very much. And I suppose, and I've got through my exams, and I've taken part in a lot of play. This doesn't mean very much. My ability as an actor, my own opinion of my ability as an actor goes down every time I go in for a play. Still, it's fun to be in them even if the people, other people in them are rather odd. And it can't be a complete waste of time. I spent the first fortnight of my holiday with the University Theatre Group at Cheltenham. They'd hired one of the theatres for three weeks to try and do some repertory. It was really rather funny. We did As You Like It in Modern Dress, a very gimmicky production. A friend of mine designed the sets and then couldn't go and paint them himself, so I painted them. We got hammered by the press. For that part, I had a small bit part in it, which it doesn't matter. We spent hours up each For two days and nights, we were up painting and building the sets. <laughs> and then, then the thing didn't get the white up it might have done. Still, the theatre itself was an amusing little place. It had been a swimming bath in Victorian times and was lined with cast iron columns and the floor sloped in the manner of swimming baths and there was a gallery that you couldn't get up to because it was a it had been blocked off in days since when they used to play water polo there. Following week we did a and European play The Queen and the Rebels by Hugo Betty. This set was not particularly designed by anybody but was left rather to the producer and myself, and we, between us we knocked up something that wasn't too bad. I had an even smaller bit part in that. One as an old man who sat and solidly chewed his nails and spat on the floor for the first act, and secondly, as a greasy young thug that ran on stage and off again. The difficulty with this part was that I had sworn I wasn't going to shave my beard for either part, and trying to disguise the diff make some distinction between man with the only 
two men with beards when I was playing both of them. It was quite difficult. Still, it was interesting and good fun. It was a bit primitive living conditions we had there then. We were sort of in a boys club. Um, and out of it at the same time. That's to say we arranged to stay at this boys club at a very cheap rate. We had the use of their kitchen to make our breakfast in, which was totally inadequate. They had also lent us some tents and some canvas beds. Well, as the first two nights I was there, I was up painting scenery. I didn't secure either a place in the tent or a bed until the second week, and was left perched on one of the settees with a couple of blankets wrapped around me. Um, and no matter how often I pointed out to the mob that my need was greater than theirs, I got very little sympathy out of it. Well, what for the rest of the year? I helped somebody produce the dumb waiter by Harold Pinter. Clay, you should see if, you get, if it gets produced anywhere near you better. That is to say, I supplied him with tea, I bought his cigarettes for him, and I arranged the chairs around the room for him. I sat in his rehearsals and tried to keep awake. Rehearsal after rehearsal. I told his cast off when he put, when he didn't want the responsibility for it, and I got his set built for him. In short, I was general factotum and executive, with no responsibility except to him. It was good fun, though, and good experience. And then I had the only amusing part I've had this year today as a greasy Italian innkeeper in Man of Destiny by GBS. Anyway, get off the subject of plays. It's not as if it's that important in my life. After the two weeks at Cheltenham, we, I went down to, to Fareham to find Mummy and Daddy with the fishes. And of course, Mummy and Daddy immediately had to leave because Daddy's chief engineer died the day before. So I was a week down there sailing around Portsmouth Harbour virtually on my own, um, with Doreen and Robin coming when they could. Then I came back and got the boat ready for a week at Fareham, at uh, Menai Bridge, erased Fareham. At Menai Bridge, we, sa we sailed tentatively in a regatta, that's to say we. Mummy and Daddy were there for two days, but didn't sail at all. And then there was Peter Deitch, who produced this play, The Dumb Waiter, that I was assistant producer for, who was recovering from a nervous breakdown, and Ilse's sister Inga. Well, the three of us didn't exactly finish a race. In fact, we only started three out of the five. But we had a good time, and we sailed gently. We didn't sail as badly as some other people, who should have known better than us. And we saw a little bit of whales. Then, money being, situation being what it was, I went back to Birmingham. Worked for five weeks in the post office. Post office supplies, that is. It's a vast storehouse with employing 4,000 odd people. Well, I was employed hammering wooden battens on cable drums of varying sizes. This in itself isn't so bad. There's an awful lot of tensions you can let off in hammering nails in. I also was allowed to use a, a machine that tightens up steel strapping round the drums. This too is quite an interesting job in itself, in that you can apply your strength and break the bands and feel very satisfied about it. However, the job lost its interest when, when I found it was necessary not to work hard and fast and get the job done, but to keep your eye on the number of drums that were start stacking up ahead of you, and see estimate how many of them that would, you could get through before tea break. And as it was almost certainly could you get through more three times over before tea break, you then had to go down to a third speed so that you didn't finish them before your tea break, otherwise you would be left standing around and idle, and be in for a rocket for not being busy. You could take as long as you liked finishing one drum. In fact, one student that was working there set up a record by taking all day over one, instead of the usual 15 or 20. But finish before time when you were for it. 
this job went on and on and on, and we had to get up very early for it, and we didn't get paid very much for it, and I was really rather glad to finish. All the same, while I was there, I went down to a friend's wedding. It's odd thing, I never thought of my friends getting married before. The last wedding I went to was Mary's, and the one before that I think was one of the Condon people, I can't remember who they Chris is considerably older than the rest of us, that's to say four years, and he's been to Oxford, and he's been engaged for two or three years, but even so, it hit me as rather a shock. Um, he was married down in Somerset, near Burnham on Sea. So I hitchhiked down the night before his wedding, and spent the night in a hen house, because I couldn't find his house. 2.30 in the morning, and I didn't feel like knocking up people to ask the way. Next morning I was welcomed with a bath and a breakfast and about 16 cups of coffee. It took me up to about 10.30. And I was allowed to help polish the glasses. I was allowed to keep to act as car park attendants outside the church. The wedding was very pretty. Stella didn't get married in white, because they couldn't afford it. But the service was nice and simple and short and very pleasant, and it was a beautiful day, and the reception was held in the garden with not too many people, most of whom we, we knew, even, and went off very well. The only hitch was that one of Chris's other friends, there were four of us enough around together in Birmingham, didn't show up until six o'clock, two hours after Chris had gone, and ten minutes after the rest of us left. He tried to hitch it out, out down on the Saturday, and by a series of mistakes, it failed altogether. It's funny. I suppose I should see more and more of my friends getting married now. Oh well, this is no time to get maudlin about my friends. So I'll change the subject and talk about what I'm doing this next year. I'm changing my course somewhat. That's to say, I'm not leaving the English faculty, but I'm going on to a special course within it. Instead of doing English literature from Anglo-Saxon through Middle English up to the present day, I shall leave out all English literature after the Shakespeare period and go back through Middle English to Anglo-Saxon, Old Gothic, Old High Norse, Icelandic, Old Norwegian, and possibly Old French, possibly Old Italian. This is a special ancient languages course, which is, I suppose, intended to enable one to read the sagas and the the romances and the legends of the Dark and the Middle Ages. This is partly as a sort of discipline for myself, and partly because it's a, a course which is not so commonly taken, and may therefore enable me to get a better degree, and also to have a higher price if I wish to stay in university as a career. And partly because I think there may be a lot worse reading that I can't read at the moment because I don't know the languages. Whereas I know perfectly well that if I ever am going to read English literature, I can, since Shakespeare, I'm perfectly well equipped to do it as I am. I suppose there isn't really an awful lot I can say to you, Betty. Except perhaps to tell you about Birmingham. Birmingham's an odd city, Betty. I thought when I first went there that I wasn't going to like it. I thought it's a dirty city in the middle of the Midlands, the middle of the black country, huge and rather unpleasant. When I got there I found it's rather a green city, at least the southwest side is. Travelling on some of the buses to the university, you come onto the top of hills and you can see the university buildings, great sort of red blocks in the distance. From about three or four miles away, and in between, all you can see are trees with the occasional chimney sticking through. You know perfectly well that the houses are underneath the trees, row upon row upon row of them. But there are trees down every road, and trees in all the gardens, and they're tall enough to cover most of the houses. And the effect is of a forest with houses in it, rather than houses with a few trees around them. University buildings themselves are, are sort of, well, Edwardian Byzantine. Great big red buildings with huge onion domes, 
and worthy brick mosaics around the outside with sort of communistic subjects of the dignity of labor and so on. And right in the middle of this, these buildings are formed in a sort of D shape, and right in the middle of the D is a huge great tower, the tallest building in Birmingham. By American standards, it's not all that high, but it stands out as a landmark in Birmingham, all right. A great finger of a tower with a clock on it that you can see from miles away. Buildings are rather ugly, really, but early in the morning, when the mist's still hanging around the bottom of them, and the sun's just shining on them, and there are trees in the background, it can look rather beautiful. The end of Birmingham I live in is rather bizarre, too. From walking from the Bristol Road, you can walk up Gough Road. Now, Gough Road falls into two parts. The lower half is a sort of slum area, very mixed racially and, and socially. Some houses that are falling to bits, some that are quite wealthy, and, but most of them working class houses packed full of ch people and children of all races. Then, then you move into a sort of decayed genteel area where there's lots of um, furnished rooms, largely occupied by students and um, teachers, bank clerks, and people with not too much money but who want a little independence. Next you walk into a road called Arthur Road, which is full of huge houses, costing 25, 30,000, even 40,000 each. Then you cross the main road, and you go past a little ancient church, and down the hill, past the golf course. When you go down past the golf course, you can imagine yourself out in the country. There are fields on either side of the road, and the road goes down into a dip so that you can't see houses at all. Actually, on the golf course itself, there is a lake and woods, beautiful bluebell woods in the spring. And then when you stand by the lake and watch the swans and the grebes and the coots and the cormorant and the moorhens and the ducks, you can imagine yourself miles away. You can't see any building at all, not even the university tower, which is only a quarter of a mile away. If you carry on down past the road, away from the golf course, you come to the university and then back into the slums. And the whole of this distance is less than two miles. I'll go back to the golf course. You have the golf course around two sides of the lake. Around the other two sides you have this woodland with the bluebells in it. This is a sort of nature preserve, full of grey squirrels and woodpeckers and birds, quite common, but still in their natural habitat, quite beautiful. But if you go into that and take a little winding path, you suddenly come past a tree, and there ahead of you, you see the willow pattern plate, or at least not exactly the willow pattern plate, but something very like it. What it is, in fact, is the University Botanical Gardens, with no fences around it, no way to divide it from this wood, which is a sort of nature preserve. It just appears right in the middle of it. It has great big sort of rhubarb plants, about four feet high, with prickly stems. It has rhododendrons of all colours, from orange to deep purple. Plants like rhod rhododendrons, all sorts of xerophytic plants, rock plants, exotic flowers of thoughts that I couldn't pronounce in Latin and I don't understand it, and I don't know the English for. It may not even be an English name for it. Right down the middle runs a stream, and across the stream there's a little wooden bridge, just like the one in the willow pattern plate. And on either side of the stream, there are just enough willow trees to make up the pattern and little cherry trees too, with blossoms on them. The whole thing is rounded off by a rock garden and a little summer house. When I first saw it, I hardly believed it was true. It was too much a copy of the original, and yet it wasn't, because the summer house was the wrong side, and it was so obviously there for scientific purposes. Anyway, that's enough about the golf course and the botanical gardens. Then. Apart from that, Birmingham has to offer one of the biggest networks of canals. Possibly the best way from the centre of Birmingham out to the university starts from the unlikely little road called Gas Street. There's the central canal basin, and you can go down onto that 
the long past old decaying wharves and out into into fields along the canal right out to the infrastructure. Infest- it's funny, but the only nice bit of that canal is the bit between the centre of town and the university. Thereafter it goes through gasworks, stinking factories, chemical works, out past Austin's until it reaches the country again some eight miles further out of town. It's not a bad place to get away from, Birmingham. The Licky Hills are only, what, two or three miles away, and the Clents another t- about six, perhaps. Malvern's are about forty miles away. Stratford's within 30 miles, and, well, Wales is only 80, and if you use your thumb as much as we do, it's not difficult to get away from. I see I haven't got much tape left to talk to you, Betty. So, all I have now to do is to wish you a Merry Christmas. You, and Rick, and Ricky and Reggie. Mary and Miffy and John and Mother and all the rest of the family and a Happy New Year. I hope I shall be able to come and see you soon, Betty. In two years I'm reckoning on going across. I promised my American friends that I'm going over there in two years. And come what may, I shall arrive somehow or other. I think some ship must be able to find a cheap passage on. Once there, I've well, I hope I shall be able to earn my way round the continent. Well, I mustn't say any more, or I shall let the tape run off and leave you hanging in mid-sentence. So, Merry Christmas again, and God bless you all. Hello, Betty, this is Mummy. It's just a very short length of tape left on this side. The yeah, um just about to start the other side and it comes up the 27th of October and we really must get the tape finished. Uh, I've had some trouble. Oh, hello. I was just going to say I've had some trouble with the end of the tape. Somehow or other it kept twisting. But anyway, I hope that now it's going to be all right. As I said before, this is the 27th of October, a Friday, and the first day of uh, Anthony's half term. Yesterday, Daddy was in Liverpool to a lunch and in the evening to a dinner in Southport. I celebrated the morning by having a cyst taken off my eye in Wrexham Hospital, and then went to Mary. And we both slept at Mary's house last night as it was too far for Daddy to come right away home. This morning, Anthony went to school and we came back here this afternoon. And Mary's going to collect him on Sunday. I think he is hoping to play to you on the piano the first Noel but it will have to be better than he can do it at the moment. He'll have to put in some practice tomorrow morning. We've had very wet weather this month. September was a very pleasant month, but October has been very, very wet indeed, with lots of high winds and some thunder. Um, So far, the leaves have not all come off the trees, and at the moment they're looking very nice, Um, golden, I think, uh, what do you call it in America? I forget. Oh yes, the fall. Tonight, Daddy is in uh, Sandidno to another function. He's a very busy person these days. I should have gone too, but uh, I'm afraid I now have a black eye. And uh, we had promised Anthony that he should come for half term. So really it was quite a good thing that I couldn't go. The cyst was caused by a sty on the bottom lid that didn't empty itself and just settled into a hard lump. I've had it for two months. I expect you'll find the first side of the tape rather peculiar. It begins with David, that is Eileen and Bill's son, 
reading a story, an Enid Bratton story about Noddy. He, it was uh, done on the day before he went to bed with the measles, hence the cough. My only regret is that I didn't get Auntie to say something as well. It was uh, within a few days of her death. The only nice thing was that uh, that day and the day before we played your tape to her so that she heard your message twice, Betty. We shall miss her very much this Christmas, I'm afraid. It won't seem like Christmas without Auntie Nellie. What we're going to do, I'm not sure. It seems uh, uh, pretty certain that the Davises won't be here. Herbert always has many things to do, and that Mary and Anthony like to go to their own church on Sunday, uh, on Christmas Day, and usually Anthony takes part in the children's service there. I sometimes wish that John had more friends in Glimperio. It's quite dull for him here unless he brings someone home, as he knows none of the people, except friends and uh, people of our generation. Hello, everybody. Today is Sunday and the last week of the October, and I've come to Glen. I plan to leave from the airport to stay with them and their car or the start term. It's a glorious autumn day and I have a really lovely flower. You can imagine the leaves all the way through the countryside and all the way through the forest. And it really was a lovely trip. I just recorded this once, but unfortunately I didn't have the public factory and then I felt that nothing happened. So now I've got to spend all over again like I said to it seems a bit silly to be sending a Christmas message in the middle of October. I'm even worse to realise that I really want to have a Christmas past the pack of the what to talk about. And I haven't even thought that I've never seen one of them yet. I know very well I've been going back to start since my birthday Christmas for the year and probably now have to meet us. So we'll see what we can do and I hope we have some time for Christmas. This year we've had our usual Followed in the Isle of Wight until now, and had a long past day with me once for a lucky thing. I once for my embrace. He thought on to me that the baby would be in the tree, which he was reasonably well, and he's learning gradually to say that he didn't feel very much so he would be in the tree, as we had a lot of my readings during the six weeks we were on. He said, so we can look around for what reason to be in the world. He said I'd rather that he said if you're going to go there. That time's not a silly mess yet, in the room. Did we tell you last winter, Anton had swimming lessons at being more guards? Um, and now he can swim 75 yards, and he's just learning to dive. I think he finally enjoys it, and he's has a lesson on a Wednesday. What speeds? A half day at school, but he has to go to school on a Saturday morning. I have had him to last the school about quarter to twelve, and he has a lesson at twelve o'clock. He will eat the time and fish and chips for lunch. I'll see he's got swimming, so I'll arrive. Betty will look like that. One time I didn't need to get the children off. Now I can jump in and I'm learning to drive. I suppose I can't find a reason to look. I've also learned to be a poor when I'm about to be. Finally, I'm going to be a very much better in this winter. This summer we are applied, and I've played with a magic house baby, which is a dark color. Um, 136 half left baby. All these things are open and very toy the time. The kind of girl that was very pleased with himself was when he could skip the floor, and he could never put that down to all the other exercise and so As I report this, I'm sitting on the morning room floor. Doing the hand say and then winter flowers on my concert. Still do a fair amount of this and you know all what was left as I used to. I find the um quartel material. Do you have a quartel? Um it's one of these things that we can wash and 
Просто това се сървам в някакви дума. Това е възможно. Значи да сте 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 I have got a little boat now. It is called Bambi. She is very quick through the water. She has a sail and oars. I often go around Yarmouth where I go for my summer holidays. I go down to, to Norton Beach, quite close to the harbour, and also row around the harbour. I always enjoy having the rudder in because I like to steer. I have quite a nice time in Yarmouth, and it always seems so exciting when I'm going out on a, on a long run in the car. I, I, I always like to go to different places, like Tennyson Memorial on the top of a hill in a, in a place quite near Yarmouth. It is near the Needles Lighthouse. It is, the lighthouse is red and white striped. It is quite big and sends a beam for ships to see coming in because of all the rocks. Tennyson Memorial is in Freshwater Bay. There is quite a bit of a beach, but it is a little bit rocky in some places. Bambi has a very nice tan sail. It is a gunter egg boat, and I have a Royal Solon Yacht Club Bergie to fly at the top of the mast. But it, it will not go straight, so we have to, so I am going to have to tie it on straight next year. I, I enjoy sailing in Bambi very much. She goes quite fast sailing, but going up the streams of boats in the harbour, we have to tack quite a bit. And that I can't do by myself, but I am allowed to go up one stream and back a few times on my own. I stay in a hotel called the Old House. It is quite an old place, and we know the person that runs it. It is very nice to get very good meals there, but it is nearly always the same every day. It's called the old house. <laughs> By the yacht club, there, there is a little hut called the race officer's hut, where all the sailing races, they have a little cannon that starts the race. It is very tiny, and they put up signals on a big pole. I'm not quite sure what they are for, but I have seen them doing it. Quite near to Yarmouth, 
Well, if you say around, there's another place called Cows. There, there is a lot of sailing races. They have lots of big cannons there, along in a row. And in Calgary, which is a week when there is a lot of sailing, they have lots of warships and the, and the Royal Yacht Britannia there. And you can go out by boat to go around them. This year, I went on board one of the warships. It was an Italian ship. There was a lot to see and the decks were burning hot. And every time I walked on a hot bit, it burned my feet. The guns are covered with little caps, gold caps, and sometimes their canvas as well. They are very big. The, the anti-aircraft guns have very big strong springs on them, so that when they shoot forward, as they fire, they always go back again. The helmsman, or the captain, as he sometimes is, showed me round the ship and showed me how the telegraph worked. Daddy went for a cruise round the coast from Liverpool on a ship called the Pacific Coast. It was a cargo boat but carried passengers. The second mate showed me how everything worked and let me sit up in a little chair and see everything that was going on. He showed me the life patterns and how the telegraph worked and showed me how, the, how they turned the wheel and how the radar worked. We went up above the steering bridge to see the radar. The officer turned the radar around for me and, and I had a drink on board. Daddy's cabin had two beds in it, one for his friend, Uncle Mike Wiltshire, and one for Daddy. It was quite small, with curtains across the window. I was allowed to hoot the hooter on the ship. When I did it, the officer pulled down a little cap and I pulled a lever over to the right halfway and the ship siren gave a long, loud hoot. Come on, quickly. When the ship was going, it gave three loud hoots. One, when I was running along to the stern to see my friend the second mate, which made me jump, then another when I was there, and that made me jump, and another when they were almost round the corner from the dock they were in. They were in. Happy Christmas, all of you. We've just played back what Anthony said, and he seems to have taken up so much tape that I'm now just going to say a happy Christmas to everybody from both Herbert and I, as there isn't room for him as well. And maybe one of these days we'll all be together again for Christmas. Bye-bye. Surprisingly enough, they have found room for me, but not very much, because being the least important member of the main eyes, it doesn't really matter. But uh, the recorder is at Oxford Hall today. I've just been listening to what Anthony has said to you. I used to think I could talk, but believe me, my son can do a lot better than I can. I think he's bound to be Prime Minister someday, but I don't know for which party. Anyhow, it's very nice to talk to you, and I hope you all have a good Christmas, especially with children, and with all that number they should have. Anyhow, here's all the best to you, and I hope that you fully enjoy yourselves, and we'll probably be thinking about you drinking your healthy black currant juice or something similar on Christmas Day. Bye, and happy Christmas all of you.
Well, now, this greeting once a year seems such a silly thing. <clears throat> one feels it should be at least once a month. In any case, one gets so little practice with it that uh, each time one picks it up, one has almost got to find its way around with it. That is, how far one should be away from the mic, how far what volume we should have on, how loud one should speak. Thus, instead of getting a more skilled performer, each year one starts to as a sort of amateur. Anyway, without making any promises, I hope we will try to do better by each other. Certainly, as I think I said last year, your photographs and your voices on the tape do seem to bring all of you that so much near. Just at this moment, I'll have to go and send Tinker to lay back on his mat, because he's coming up to me and pouring my hand, which is poised over the pause and button of the recorder. I think he actually wants to go out to join Mummy, who has gone into the scullery. Go on, Tink. Off you go. And Tinker is now gone, so I'll try and continue. I suppose to us as a family... Aunt Nellie's death has been the most disturbing event over this side. It still seems odd to be going near to Nuneaton on occasions on our trips down south, and to think that there is no one there that we know at number 35 Norman Avenue. But as Sir Rick's mother so wisely said, the old must die and the young may and there is nothing we can do about it, except to hope that during our passage we have done what we could for others. Both Mummy and I now recognize that we are in the classification of old. And being uh, uh, regarded as an elderly person seemed to be up. Uh, though I can still feel a little objective in considering this, um, being an old man, because um, I don't feel as old as I thought people did when they got to my age, whatever feeling old is like. Photographs give some, some idea how one must appear to other people, so I do not uh, show surprise when I hear my staff referring to me as the old man. To Ricky and Reggie and Co., I must seem like Father Todd. Even John the other day was talking to me about someone at their university, and he referred to him as an old folk of about 40. He, of course, did not mean that intentionally. He uh, was uh, talking without thinking uh, that he was talking to uh, Rising 64. I suppose, therefore, I must be one of the young in part, at least I hope so. And that is, I think, rather like your mother, Rick, what I hear and read about her. Also, your Aunt Innes and her husband, who paid us a visit this year. We did so enjoy seeing them and having them stay with us. I think they enjoyed their stay also. I uh, hope you all... Uh, send some more of your friends or acquaintances if any of them are coming this way as we should love to have them with us. We had a letter a week or two back from Alicia and um, Mummy will no doubt be replying to it. But, uh, uh, she was uh, extraordinarily generous and uh, I think I have to write myself because it's not often that I get uh, references from ladies these days referring to me as an ideal man, which she assured me I'm still so considered by her and the dot. Mummy will have told you that I am this girl as chairman of the Institution of Electrical Engineers, Merseyside and North Wales Centre. Well, this is involving me in a lot of meetings, um, both in Liverpool and Chester, and other places in the territory, 
as well as the very regular meetings in London on the Council of the Institution of Electrical Engineers. It's all very interesting <coughs> and to a degree a compliment, of course, of being chosen for such an office. It has happened um, in an unfortunate year in some respects. As you know, we had to break our holiday due to the loss of my chief engineer, and uh, we've got an awful lot of work on in addition to that. Um, however, I'm hoping we'll cope, um, but shall not be sorry when the pressure of the business is um, over. We get in some cool weeks. For instance, the week before last, I had the uh, uh, Institutional Electrical Engineers official dinner in uh, the Grove Hotel in Chester. Monday night, Wednesday night at King, uh, Tuesday night at King Town. Wednesday night, Bobby and I went to Birmingham and back to um, listen to three plays that John the drama section of the university were putting on. He was in two of them. Which meant we didn't get to bed until nearly two o'clock that night. The next night I was home, and then the night after that, we were at the headquarters dinner at dance in Liverpool, and um, that of course didn't finish until well after midnight. Fortunately, we had stopped at Mary's overnight, which saved a long journey back into North Wales. And that was particularly useful that evening because there was thick fog between Liverpool and Chester. Mummy and I have been talking about your suggestion that the two boys might come over and spend their holiday with us next year. We think that would be wonderful. Tell them I've just stopped the jobs round here with two husky boys from felling trees to uh, shooting pigeons. And uh, if you could possibly manage it, we would be nothing more delightful than to have them over here for that period. And Mummy wants to add some more before we get to the end of the team. So I think that I'd better Close off now by sending you my Christmas wishes to you all for a very happy Christmas and a very happy New Year. To you, Betty and Rick, and all the children, and your mother, Rick, and all your friends that may be associated with you over the Christmas period. And please give our best wishes to um, Auntie and Uncle Harrington Pay. With that, I'll sign off. Bye-bye. Hello, Betty. This is Mrs. Davis to wish you and Mr. Greenwood and the children a very happy Christmas and a very happy New Year. We got rice waiting last Saturday and turned out very nice. We'd be very proud to see you and the children after doing the last week. Mr. and Mrs. Pet look very well. Well, well, that's pleasant. I hope to see you very soon again. Well, I must be out now to you with this. Hello, Betty. This is the, almost the very last day when we can send the tape to be sure of it arriving in time for Christmas. Tomorrow is actually the date. There's the little of the tape left. It's my chore to finish it. Not a chore, a pleasure. Daddy has told you some of our recent activities. And in addition to things connected with the office and the Institution of Electrical Engineers, we've also been concerned recently with the, yacht, with the sailing club to which we belong. Last Saturday we went to the first annual dinner and dance and a very, very happy evening it was. I don't know if you know that Daddy is Commodore, uh, which was his duty to pro propose the health of the Queen, the Duke of Lancaster, as the function took place in Lancashire. And afterwards he also uh, proposed 
the health of the uh, of replied to the toast of the association. In it, he uh, told the members how he came to be uh, to know Mr. Anderson, who saved it from extinction, and uh, probably how he came to be. That was the reason why he came to be Commodore. After all the speechy buying, uh, the trophies for the season were presented by no less than me. I was very, uh, very lucky to have a beautiful bouquet given to me. I think as a reward for my small service. It was presented by the bride of the year. Uh, she and her husband were married in the middle of July and uh, spent their honeymoon sailing in company with four or five other silhouettes from Anglesey to, to the Isle of Man. They had to wait there for four or five days for suitable weather to make the return and that was how they spent their honeymoon. Uh, the cruise was accompanied by uh, Judge Merrick Evans, uh, the local circuit judge. He has a, a much larger boat and uh, acted as guard ships for them. By the way, he was the guest of honour for the evening and replied to the toasts of the guests. Early in, Dece in December, we are going to have another week's holiday in lieu of the one that we lost in July. That is, uh, providing we are still able to go. Unfortunately, Daddy has a colleague who is uh, very, very ill and not expected to live uh, more than a few hours now. He's lost many of the old team this year. In some ways, it's rather hard for him. Been three retirements and this will make two deaths. We're going to stay with Norman and Peggy. We hope to see Uncle Bill and Auntie Ivy. We're going to um, an IEE function in Southampton. And we also hope to spend a few days or couple of days on the Isle of Wight and see what it is like in the winter time. I must say that the last few minutes on the tape seem to have been a, a description of a hectic time. I must, we do, uh, do not spend the majority of our time like this. It just happens always in the couple of months before Christmas. And now I really must say goodbye to each of you. Ricky, I hope you're still doing well at school. Also, Reggie, I hope Mary is getting along nicely with her dancing and that Miffy is enjoying her first year at school. Lots of love to John. This is from all of us, Grandpa and John as well. Love to you, my dear, Betty, and to Rick. I wish we could be with you. Give my very best love to your mother. I hope she's making good progress. And uh, we're looking for news of your new home. You haven't yet told us when you're likely to be leaving Vienna. <coughs> I did start this tape uh, before Christmas last year and recorded on it uh, a very nice choir uh, the Brompton Oratory Choir singing carols, Christmas carols, and I thought what a lovely start it would be to our tape. But unfortunately, John had one of a similar shape, size and appearance for a Christmas present, and he thought it was that, and he wiped it all off by recording for himself on it. So you haven't got the Christmas music. And so far, it hasn't started. Now it looks as if the tape is just going to run off, so with all our love to all of you, a very, very happy Christmas, and may we be not too long before we meet again.